Hey there, neighbors and naysayers. It's Clint Finney again for another Eastern Ohio Grazing Council. Pasture walk in the winter for March 11th, 2021. This week, we went up to visit Mr. Kevin Swope at Heritage Lane Farm to look at his winter feeding operations and talk about the different livestock species that he's feeding through the winter and how he does it. So let's get started. But first, some sad news to pass along to those of you that have been coming to Eastern Ohio Grazing Council Pasture Walks for the past several years, or actually since its beginning. Our good friend Cliff Miller passed away this past week, and uh, if you hadn't seen it on the Facebook post or in other places, but Cliff was actually our first president for the Eastern Ohio Grazing Council. He was there at its inception, and... Um, I believe he was the driving force behind a lot of what we did with the Eastern Ohio Grazing Council. A good man, great to have around for the pasture walks, always greet you with a smile and a handshake, uh, always had a question, always had a comment, always had a productive thing to say about the Grazing Council and a productive way for us to move. And I'm going to miss Cliff uh, a lot for the fact that every time I was speaking, I always knew Cliff would have a question. But I always knew that I could poke fun a little bit at Cliff, and I always knew that he would poke right back at me. Uh, we, we enjoyed a good banner back and forth, and, and he made me think probably more than I made him think, and I tried to make him think an awful lot. So Cliff, we're going to miss you. But the one thing Cliff always wanted to do was to grace his cows through the entire winter. Just one winter he wanted to make it through without feeding hay. I don't know that he ever did it, but that doesn't matter. As grazers, it's the goals that drive us and that move us forward. And Cliff knew that full well. And the one thing that I would say to Cliff today is, where you're going, buddy, the cows graze all winter long. Rest in peace, old friend. We're going to hear from Kevin on his operation here in just a moment. But uh, if, if you ever heard Kevin talk about his heavy use pad there at their farm. Um, the one thing that I think has always hit home to me about his heavy use pad and his plan for winter feeding is that he took a look around a couple of years ago at what farmland was selling for in his area and, and it's about the same price and it's about all the areas the Eastern Ohio Grazing Council touches. If you can buy property for three thousand dollars an acre you probably better get it bought and it's typically going to be in the six thousand dollar an acre range and kevin realized that he was tearing up a certain number of acres every year feeding hay and said well i can't buy that he's limited on acres like all of us are i mean aren't we all and he realized that i can't buy an acre of land for what it would cost me to just build a heavy use pad to be able to feed the livestock on and not tear up that acre. And it may sound like a one-time thing, but if you're tearing up that, an acre a year after year after year, it doesn't have to be the same acre. You're losing production on that, that acre every year, probably in up, sometimes in upwards of 100% of the production you're losing the next year. And, and in this way, he, he built a heavy use pad to alleviate that torn up area, and it's less than an acre. So that's how we justified building. I think it was a great way to look at it, a great way to think about building a heavy use pad so that we don't tear up our fast pasture fields. Now, the one thing that our seasoned veterans that, that, that talk about heavy use pad will say, but yeah, but we're not spreading the manure out. We're not unrolling hay like we saw at John's a week, week or two ago. Uh, yeah, that's true. We're collecting it all in one place. And so then it has to be hauled out and spread. And we have to be careful about the runoff from these pads and things but if, if we apply or get all this manure on this particular area we can then clean it up and then we can apply it to the field yes it takes a tractor and it takes diesel fuel and all that but we can apply it to an area in the rate and timing and effect that we want it to be applied and sometimes we can get a little better nutrient management out of it by spreading it and applying it the way we want to in the time that we want to and in the rate that we want to so just think about that going ahead basically what we do with our heavy use pad winter is a time when i like to spend time in the wood shop and doing other things so I, my main objective is 
not to damage pastures when it's too wet in the uh, early winter and the second objective is not to have to start a tractor every day so we've got multiple ways that we feed uh, the, the, the buffalo are either locked down on here if it's too wet or if it is uh, frozen like it is now they can go out they can come down here and there's plenty of feeders they can move around I have to have plenty of room for everybody to get around a feeder and be able to eat but I'll put feed out we'll put bales out about once a week week and a half however long it takes for them to empty them uh, there's a water there's a heated water on the pad here and not everything here is graveled or it's a, it's just a stone pad we use mill slag there the section here behind the sawmill shed is all stone and then there's a stone l-shaped pad here that's 24 feet wide and an l and then we took the earth that we had uh, excavated out for the stone pad and put it here in the middle uh, it makes a little bit of a mound it's been in there now probably 10 or 12 years it's starting to get worn down but whenever it's wet and a little bit nasty weather conditions the animals can go and lay you can see they like to lay on that mound and get get up a little higher but this gives them an opportunity to to get around and eat and have water and then they can go out to pasture uh, we do have uh, some of the we what we try to do is the the pastures that are close to this pad we try to it's not a true stockpile but we allow that grass to grow late into the fall and I hold it until uh, the weather conditions are right and then we open the gates and we allow them access to those pastures that surround this heavy use pad and they can go out and they can pick around but then they can come back down here to the pad they can get water here uh, there's the mineral feeders down here and they like to the, the bison like to feel like they're migrating I guess I don't know but they will go out and then they, they would go out a lot up until we got this ice even they don't like this ice this crust that's on the ground I see they haven't been out much they're like the cattle we saw at John's there they don't like that ice on the surface so they'll stay down here and they've been content just to stay down here and hang out uh, we've got multiple ways that we can feed down here two additional practices around Kevin's heavy use pad one he mentioned and one I'm not sure they did um, one the windbreak that he has around the outside of the heavy use pad all of the sides of his heavy use pad are sort of protect it um, so it doesn't matter what direction the weather comes from uh, they've got an area that's protected from the weather coming in uh, but this is just an arborvitae planted windbreak around the outside of the heavy use pad and he did have to protect it a little bit from the deer there to get it started and get it going but um, a good practice an underutilized practice around our heavy use pads we really need to think more about putting a windbreak in around the heavy use pads that we put in and the second he did mention was the mound and it's hard to see in the snow and I've got some pictures coming up here but you can see that some of those buffalo are kind of elevated above the rest and that's just that mound that he put in and we're going to talk about that in the next few slides as we go but I think it's something that a lot of us should consider with a heavy use pad you can see that kind of pad there off to the right um, or that mound there off to the right uh, that was just earth that he removed from the area before he put stone down and they, they kind of packed it down and, and the buffalo do use that to get up on and get out of the heavy use pad area and I think it's something that we really should consider more often with our heavy use pads here just because the surface of those heavy use pads gets so sloppy sometimes when we get real a lot of rain and, and at times when we're, we're really going to use a heavy use pad is when it's going to be sort of sloppy and, and to give those animals somewhere to get up and get away from that kind of sloppiness and, and be able to lay down uh, is a good thing in a heavy use pad. And I think we could build them with earth like Kevin did. I think we could even build a heavy use pad in such a way that we could take the manure off of it when we're done using it one year, pile it on one side, allow that to be the mound the next winter and then the next year push the manure off to the other side and just go ahead and spread the mound that we used that winter as the manure from the year before would be then composted broke down a little bit more 
uh, but we could we could do this in such a way that we could have that mound be kind of mobile and something that we could move but also be that composting bedded pack kind of outside uh, so that we could spread it on the field but I think there's lots of things that we need to think about and and things we need to try with these mounds it's something that they do out west to do in the big feedlots it's just not something we do a lot in Ohio but I think it's something that, that bears consideration if we're going to build a heavy use pad if we're going to allow the animals access on and off of the heavy use pad we need to really think about surfacing that area so that it doesn't just become a muddy mess we built the heavy use pad to keep the animals out of the mud sometimes it's worth it to go ahead and build an additional sort of access road off or trail or walkway off for the livestock to be able to enter and exit the pad as always for winter we need to look at the water what are we using for water uh, in the on the heavy use pad Kevin's got this um, kind of Mirico water I believe they call these uh, big spring or little spring waters um, it, it's a heated water it's got a sort of a bird bath type heater in it and also he's got a light bulb in there that keeps that thing thawed and outside of that he said it just takes maintenance um, if it gets dirt and stuff in the, the trough there that has to be cleaned out about once a week you gotta go out there and clean that out because that will affect the heater it'll get into the heater and keep it from, from keeping the water warm but also animal activity keeps that thing thawed it, it's, as long as the water's constantly turning over the livestock are drinking from it that helps to keep it thawed and there are many different options of winter water but this is just one of them uh, but this is how they get water in the winter time um, rather than a ball water that we see a lot of places he's just got these kind of open trough little spring or whatever they're called uh, type waters with a little heater in them doesn't take much electricity and also for the most part the electricity is away from the water so you don't have to worry about stray voltage or anything but um, just takes maintenance I get questions a lot about those things growing algae or or getting gunk in it because the livestock carry things on their mouth and kind of drop it in that water and so it just takes maintenance it, it takes being cleaned out once a week or so um, just to keep them going and keep them working correctly there's a, a feeder that we have here that has a roof on it whenever it's really wet and there I, I can put that I can load that early in the year and then we can move different groups of animals and let them move around and that that's a little more weather resistant for putting hay in there and not having it just uh, just lay there and rot and get uh, subject to the weather and we've used that some but right now they're not on that because of the weather conditions we're having this just allows us a little flexibility that way uh, for that early winter feeding as well and if I need to if I need to separate or wean calves or do anything have a different group of animals I could pull them over here and have another means to put three or four bales in there and, and have one group be able to eat here and get them separated I don't know whether many of you noticed but that last bale feeder there that Kevin was showing us uh, is in the middle of his handling facility for the bison and I think that's also a little bit underutilized so often we we'll go out and think about building these heavy use pads and we don't incorporate them into the working facilities of the farmer and uh, I think a lot of times we could use them together they don't have to be separate we can use that sort of heavy use pad area as your initial initial catch pen or a weaning pen or uh, any any combination of the bunch but if we're already surfacing an area to use as winter feeding and it's something that the animals are used to going through and crossing um, why not also include our handling facility there nearby or on the pad on the edge of the pad whatever um, just a, a good utilization of the roads and all the other infrastructure it takes to get to a heavy use pad to also have that working facility there close by and and be able to use it quickly if we've got livestock on the pad for any length of time we've got that working facility right there close by um, the other thing Kevin talked about with with me privately was you know if he had it to do over again and, and build the whole farm over again his facility is all kind of on the east side and he would love it to be more centrally located so that they could pass through there in their normal paddock rotation and, and be able to have more options to let them off the pad into different fields and thus maybe stockpile some more forage in different fields around the heavy use pad not use the same couple fields every winter 
we buy about 120 round bales a year uh, from a from a broker and we usually buy about 60 first crop bales and 60 second crop bales uh, Clint had asked whether we have enough room in this this storage shed I think it's 32 by 56 if I remember correctly I'll show you the back side of the shed the back side there's a 12 foot lean to on the back side that we we put uh, I think nine or ten round bales across the backside when we first buy them when they come when they get hauled in here in June and July I'll go ahead and I'll take the wrap off I'll take the net wrap off and I'll have those already positioned back there uh, so some of the hay gets stored back there in a ready ready to feed kind of a situation same way with that roofed uh, lot that we had just looked at I'll go ahead and just fill that full of hay then because it's not getting rained on and I'll put that hay in there and we'll use that as storage and then we're already ready to feed uh, come December or if we have an emergency situation and we need to come down here. Kevin and I's discussions of making versus buying hay is well documented in the Eastern Ohio Grazing Council. But one thing that struck me as we were looking at heavy use pads and spread manure and all those things is the time savings aspect that we probably never consider. Um, Kevin's got a million irons in the fire and other things going on and, and I think he would echo the fact that not making hay saves him a bunch of time and we need to take a page out of industry out of business and, and businesses find ways to buy in products that would cost them more time or money for them to do themselves and we need to look at that in agriculture that sometimes buying a product is not a bad thing we are independent farmers are an independent lot and we think we got to make everything ourselves but in order to bring more income into the operation sometimes we need to outsource those things that are not efficient in time and money to our operation uh, this is the back side of the hay shed you can see the simple feeding arrangement we have uh, we can push hay in there and uh, the cows have access to to all the bales that uh, we, we push in there and we'll, we'll go in there in the evenings and push hay forward into the, the feeders it's nothing fancy uh, down below the the uh, pad here this is all graveled here as well all the way to the barn and down below here is a, a spring tank it's just a free gravity fed uh, spring development that feeds off the spring at the barn and it pretty well stays open year-round uh, so I don't have to mess around with water with these guys either. Uh, occasionally you'll have to break ice, but it's it's got enough flow that it usually stays open there in the middle. These were new animals to me. I hadn't been to Kevin's in many years, and uh, Kevin's always had buffalo as long as I've known him. But I knew he had bought these low-line Angus cows, but I hadn't got a chance to take a look at them. Um, but for those of you that don't know what they are, they're low-line Angus. They're, they're not miniatures. Um, they are Angus, the Angus of, of yesterday, I think, is the way I look at it. These are what Angus really looked like when they came across the pond to, to this country. Um, they're smaller in stature, of course. They're, um, I, I don't even know what the hip height measurement is, but they're off the lower end of the chart as far as frame score goes. But... Um, they're a real grass efficient type cow, um, smaller in stature, bigger body. They'll they'll still top out at a thousand pound or more, especially the bulls or steers. Um, but they're a lot smaller in stature, more efficient, more size productive to a grazing operation, um, and. There, there are those that will say they're better suited to a grass-fed operation that's selling holes and halves and quarters because the size cuts from these, these cows aren't going to be as big as some of the bigger, larger cows that we see out there in, in the world, and especially in the, in the, the feedlot-type operations. So uh, just a little bit about low lines. Now I can hear some of the seasoned cow veterans here saying to me, now low lines aren't for everyone. Miniature cows aren't for everyone. Smaller framed cows aren't for everyone. And that's true. Uh, we have to be careful about 
using these smaller in stature type cows if we're going to market them through conventional channels through the sale barn or as feeder cattle these are specifically uh, suited to a direct marketing type of operation uh, if we're going to market them in any way through conventional channels we we need those cows to be a little bit bigger just to fit the box that we're currently uh, situated currently saddled with um, they're they're going to be too small to be accepted in the the local livestock market but very good cattle for direct marketing type operations so know your market and know what you're marketing livestock to and and it may be something that that's that an animal somewhere between this size and the conventional size cow is what's efficient for you to be able to use on your operation you have to make that decision for yourself but just a word of caution about low lines or smaller in stature so at least cows i think it's something that we need to revisit at some point and talk about cow size uh, in our grazing operations uh, to, to situate them for our grazing and, and what market we're trying to meet. The back side of this shed will feed, fill it full of bales about every month, month and a half. So I only have to do that once or twice a, a winter, refill it. And actually I've just been pushing the back bales that are stacked, just flip them over into the feeder and just push them over by hand into the feeder instead of even doing it with a tractor. I kind of get everything kind of staged early in the game. I don't want to handle it more than I have to so it comes off the trailer and it goes into an area where it's ready to be fed or where it's stored. Being able to keep the keep hay stored under roof I don't have to mess around with frozen netting I don't have to mess around cutting too much off it really works well to to keep everything out of the weather and it's been a it's been a really good investment everything that we have in between the hay shed and the lots is all gravel too I just got tired of uh, all the muddy wheel tracks and everything from getting out and trying to feed this used to be an open where the barns that's used to be our open bale storage area and it, by the end of the season it was a muddy mess uh, and then you've got that all over your tractor. You got to wade through it. You're tripping over it once it freezes. I just decided to eliminate all of that and and either get it under roof or get it under gravel. And that has really helped uh, make winter feeding just it's just so much easier. We can come out and do it. And like I said, the the area behind us we feed every week, week and a half. So I only start a tractor about once a week. At, at the most to do any kind of feeding and obviously once the bales are out of there then we can store other things in there as well so it's kind of a multi-use facility and then yet another enterprise there at heritage lane farm also the sheep um, these ewes are, are in the barn because they they lamb uh, there in the barn and, and it's just easier for them to to manage them in the barn as a pen pack sort of management in the winter time uh, also, because of, of predators, they, they like to lock them up. I think they still lock them up every night. So it's just something that those ewes are used to. They're used to being in. And there's, there's not very many of them. There's just this handful of stuff. And they use these, these sheep as grazers kind of in the odd areas of the farm. They're non-destructive compared to the cattle or the bison. And so they can kind of graze them in and around their garden areas and kind of keep those, those areas kind of tidy and and it's one more product for them to market but they're feeding those sheep inside the barn as a pen pack and then they'll clean it out later and either compost or go ahead and directly spread it and this is how he feeds hay um, too often for for small operations it's not efficient to put a round bale out there with a few head of whatever livestock you might be trying to manage in Sometimes the best way is to just set a round bale up on end and simply unroll it and fill hay racks uh, to be able to allow the livestock to eat it. I've done this many, many times. I, I, I still do it at times depending on what I'm feeding. Uh, I'll set a bale up and unroll it if I've got a ram separated or just a few uh, head one way or another just to keep them from wasting so much hay. We talked about that last time. Anytime we put a round bale out, it's going to take them more than three days to eat that round bale. They're going to waste more hay than what we would like. So 
sometimes it's just easier to set a round bale up on edge and unroll it. I know we're supposed to be talking about winter feeding here, but I think because we've looked at the several different kinds of livestock there that Kevin has, and, and there are others even than this, um, Caleb manages the, the chicken operation, so they've got layers and they also raise broilers. Uh, and then the, the garden produce, anybody that's been to Kevin's knows that they've got high tunnels and, and raise flowers and lots of other garden produce and markets, farmer's markets. Uh, and this is all part of his sort of marketing plan. And Kevin can do a way better job at telling you everything that they do. But, you know, for somebody that, that goes and sees operations, it, it's not hard to figure out. See, the, the theory here is, and I've heard Joel, Joel Salatin say this many times, that it's easier to find 100 people to spend a thousand dollars with you than it is to find a thousand people to spend a hundred dollars with you it all works out to a hundred thousand dollars but it's a whole lot easier to find those hundred people to spend a thousand dollars with you so he raises bison those low lying angus cows and sheep and garden produce and cut flowers and and eggs and and poultry is a part of the operation that's just because once you've got a customer it's easier to sell them multiple things to bring dollars back to your operation. So that's where we get into diversity. We, we like to diversify a farm, especially one like Kevin that's gonna market their, their products at a farmer's market or, or to private folks. It's, it's better to have multiple products to be able to market to one particular customer. Well, that's a wrap for this week's Pasture Walk. We do want to send out a sincere thank you to Mr. Kevin Swope and his family for all that they do up there at Heritage Lane Farm. Uh, and for showing us around, taking the time out, look at their winter feeding operations and uh, all the different livestock species that they've got there at the operation. And talk about marketing. We sure do appreciate it. In the next two weeks, we'll be putting out another video on stockpiled grass. In fact, I think we've got two farms that we're going to go to and visit with about their stockpiled grass, two different operations, and show how they're managing the stockpiled grass as we wind down the winter of 2020 and 2021. So we'll be looking for those. And with that, I'll say we'll see you next time.